Hi everybody, this is Frank from GKBU. And um, today we have uh, our presenter with us, Professor Michael Bright. He's actually uh, the program leader for our new Acting for Global Screen. So without further ado, I'll just introduce, uh, quickly let Professor Bright introduce himself. Okay. Thank you very much, Frank. And good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to not see you, but you can see me, obviously. Uh, my name's Michael Bray, and I am by career a film director. I didn't start as a film director, I actually began life as an actor. I trained at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in the late 70s, had a classical education as an actor, and then I moved into theatre, working in Manchester, Birmingham, Leicester, at many repertory theatres, ending up for six years at the National Theatre of Great Britain, where I worked with the late, great Peter Hall and Peter Gill, and I worked at the National Theatre Studio, which also introduced me to lots of new writers, uh, new directors and allowed me to express my talent as a writer as well and that's where I wrote my first two stage plays The Rhythm of Love and The Back of the Bus Girls were both successfully put on at the National Theatre and I also directed them and from there I started to go into television I worked at Central Television, the BBC, BBC Two Films, Channel Four Films making quite a lot of television films and then finally I was approached by Billy Herman at Winchester Films and I made The Sea Change with Ray Winston and Mariam Darbo which was chosen for the Sundance Film Festival and from there I signed a three picture deal with 20th Century Fox and went on to do lots and lots of films. Carried on as a director, writer and a producer and finally ended up as an executive producer uh, working in London. Which uh, brings me really to why I'm now a professor at Hong Kong Baptist University because 15 years ago, I was approached by a board member of Arts Educational Schools London to investigate and look at how they were preparing actors for screen work, for film work and television work. So I went in to look and I was astonished. What I was astonished by was the fact that nothing much had happened, uh, nothing much had changed since I had trained. Now, making the move from actor to director had been a massive one for me. And I suddenly understood what an actor needed to know to be a good screen actor. And I was very disappointed to see that actors weren't being taught even the most basic things. What they were basically getting were technical classes, like how to stop on a mark, how to, to turn on a mark, how to sit into shot, how to stand up into shot. All very good technical knowledge, but utterly useless to set you up as a screen actor, to develop a, a screen career, or any kind of career really, because it was teaching you all the wrong things. So I became head of film and television at Arts Educational Schools London, and, and created an entirely new film department there, where we screened our films at BAFTA in London, BAFTA in Los Angeles, and in New York. Uh, it was a breakthrough moment, and I learned an enormous amount. Uh, so that sort of brings me to the theme of today's webinar which is do you want to be a film star well if you want to be a film star first of all you've got to be an actor and the only difference between a film star and a normal everyday jobbing actor is a, a very simple quality it's a matter of about two degrees of change in the way that you think and prepare for a part so first let's go back to basics what is acting Let's ask ourselves that very simple question, what is acting? Well, I think the best definition was summarized by Stanislavski at the beginning part of the 20th century, when he said that acting is living truthfully in imagined circumstances. That's really all it is, living truthfully in an imagined world, a world created by a writer. And the actor's job is to enter that world fully and make you, the audience, believe it, so that the audience actually think that you are the character living in that story. Acting is very simple. Uh, so why is it so hard if it's very simple? Well, first of all, lots of people overcomplicate it, but also lots of people misunderstand what it actually is. So let's talk about the process of acting. So for stage acting, the process, if you've ever done some acting, you, you will know what this is, is organic and linear. That is, wherever you do it in the world, you all go into a room, 
uh, with a text and a director and you work together. You rehearse together, you talk together, you discover the characters together, you understand the plot line, you understand the rhythm of the play, you understand the subtext of the play. You know what the other actors are going to do. You've rehearsed together. You've played games together. You've improvised around the ideas in the play together. And after whatever amount of rehearsal it is, three weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks, depending on which camp, uh, country you're in, you then have a first night. The most important thing to, rem to remember about stage acting is that you're not alone. It's, it's a feedback loop constantly. That is, when you're in a room with a director, the director's feeding back to you. The other actors are working with you. And when you walk onto a stage with an audience, the audience are working with you. They are imagining the play with you. Peter Hall at the National Theatre said, the theatre was the last place that we imagined the world together. So that's theatre. It's fantastically creative and it's very rewarding. It gives you lots of feedback, not only applause at the end of the, the production, but you get feedback directly from the audience. You can feel their silences. You can feel if they're listening, if they're reacting properly, if they're laughing. So there's a feedback loop. For the screen actor, it's entirely different. That is, it's non-linear and non-organic. That is, we shoot out of sequence. We come up with a shooting schedule which is location defined. That is, we're not there to suit, serve the actor, we're there to make the film for the smallest amount of money. So for instance, we may start with a big uh, civic block in a town center. So we may shoot in the morning, the scene where you're divorcing your wife, and in the afternoon where you marry your wife, and then that evening we'll shoot the scene where you first go out to dinner together. So it's quite complicated. So shooting out of sequence, non-linear, has enormous consequences for the actor. It's also non-organic. That is, you don't get to rehearse with the other actors. Well, not properly. You run the lines with the other actors, you work with the other actors on set, but it's not like a stage rehearsal where you develop the performances together organically. No, you'll have done all the preparation on your part utterly alone in your bedroom you've got a script and you've got your imagination and you can imagine lots of things but here's what actually happens when you walk on set for the first time if you don't know what you're doing and 90 percent of actors don't know what they're doing when they walk onto a film or television set because it's it's too difficult to replicate the first film i did was for queen and country and the actor i was working with that day was denzel washington Big film star. So I walk on, I shake hands with Denzel, and we start the scene. And I was terrible, utterly terrible. Why? Because I was terrified. Fear had utterly consumed me. My shoulders were tense, my face was tense, I, I could barely breathe. All of the ideas that I'd had, that I, the way I was going to play the part, the way I was going to do the scene, disappeared. All I wanted to do was not to attract attention to the fact that I was frightened. I just wanted to get it over and done with as quickly as possible. Obviously, I had a long time on that film and I learned how to do it. Unfortunately, because of shooting schedules now, very few actors get the chance that I had to learn on the job. And also when I'm directing and as a film director, I don't have time to coach the actor. I have no time. All I can do is to shape the performance for the actor. So that means that the non-organic bit of being a screen actor is massive. That means as a screen actor, you have to know how to generate all of that character in yourself. So it's all about the preparation. You have to know how to create the part that you're going to play. So preparation is one of the major pillars of screen acting. So you've got to think, how, how do I best stimulate my imagination? How do I best work on a text? These are things that you need to practice and you need to start practicing them now if you're going to be a screen actor. There's also another very important part of being a screen actor. And this I learned from the star actor, Michael Caine. It's concentration. When Michael Caine's on set, there's nobody else there. There's just him 
the other actor and the camera. The crew disappear. I once said to Michael Caine, I said, what gives you so much confidence? He said, I, he said, I'm not confident. He said, all I think about is what the character wants. So there it was, Michael Caine, that major film star, said exactly what Stanislavski said in the beginning part of the 20th century. You've got to play the action of the scene. You've got to be completely in the imagined circumstances of the film. So concentration is central to that. But what type of concentration do you need to be a, a proper screen actor? Because when I say the word concentration, I'm often, I often notice actors do this. They go, they sort of go beetle browed and dig their shoulders down as if, as if they're getting ready to do an exam. It's utterly wrong. The type of concentration that you need to be an actor is very different. They've done an analysis of brain waves, and what they've discovered is that a person is most creative when their alpha waves are moving in their brain. And, and that's when you're just about beyond waking up from sleep, but you're not in any way stressed. You're utterly relaxed and free. The sort of concentration you need to be a good screen actor is exactly the type of concentration that a child has when they play. When I watch my daughter playing with a doll and she's in her imaginary world, there she is just playing with a doll in her imaginary world, going round and round and round. And then I say, oh, Rose, do you want to drink? And she's immediately out of the world and she's talking to me and then she'll go back into it. That is the kind of concentration you need. That said, you have all been children, so you will understand that kind of concentration. It's a matter of rediscovering it within yourself. If you can do that and you can do the preparation and you bring the two together, you're two steps closer to giving a good screen performance. But you need the final piece of the puzzle, the third pillar for the screen actor, and that is relaxation. No tension. The flow of your emotions, the flow of your thought can only happen when you're relaxed. And when I say relaxed, I don't mean the kind of relax where you're collapsed on a, a, a sofa. That is a state of collapse. I'm talking about the sort of relaxation that an athlete needs when they're about to run the 100 meters in the Olympics. Because if there's any tension in their body or in their bones or in their muscles, it, it will inhibit them. And so it will for the screen actor. So you've got to learn ways to help yourself relax and be relaxed. So those are the three pillars of screen acting. Preparation, developing your imagination so that you can enter the world of the character. Concentration, the ability to live in that world freely and happily. And relaxation so that you can actually give your performance on screen when you want to. So let's come to the theme of this. What is the difference between a film star and a jobbing actor? In fact, I'll make it even simpler than that. One of the questions I get asked most when I do master classes with actors, when I work with student actors, with all sorts of people, is how do I get work? It's really that simple. Most actors want to get more work and they're not really sure why they're not getting it. Well, I've got the answer. It's very simple. The difference between the working actor, that is the actor who works occasionally, and the film star or the actor who is in demand, is very simple. Is that most actors are good. That is, they will give a good performance. But the film star, or the actor who's in demand all the time, is very good to excellent. That is the choices that they make. When I work with Ray Winston on The Sea Change, uh, he's a terrific actor. He's full of ideas, constantly striving to make the scene better. Similarly, when I work with Ju Julie Waters, big film star, did Educating Rita, she makes such extraordinary choices all the time. 
and that comes from a confidence. The confidence is a self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense that they're working all the time, so they're very confident, so they can deliver. But they weren't always working all the time. And I worked with Ray Winston before he became a star, but I could see that he was going to be a star because he sought excellence. That is, he didn't make do. He, he couldn't just get by. He didn't just want to do the scene well. He wanted to do it brilliantly. He wanted to find a way to bring the characters alive fully and in the moment. I've often wondered why it was that when I went to the cinema with my parents or with friends who weren't in the industry, that they could spot the most talented actors like I could. I was fascinated by it. And then I realized why. I realized why when I became a film director. Because when you sit in the edit, I've got so many things happening on a film set going through my mind. I just really want to get the film made. I want to bring the performances alive. But it is in the edit where I really study the actor's performance. And so I'm looking up at the edit and I say, let's look at take four. Let's look at take five. Let's look at take six. Now, the ordinary actor, the jobbing actor, those takes between three to six will be pretty much the same. Nothing much will happen. Very often they get worse. They get deader. And here's the killer word. They get duller. That is their performances lack life. They lack that visceral energy of a real person really reacting to something. But when you look at a film star, there's always something. You go, let's look at take seven. Take eight. My goodness, look at that. That's fantastic. Let's have a bit of this and a bit of that. You're spoilt for choice. I never forget once bumping into an old actor friend who had just done a movie. And he'd seen the movie and he was very disappointed because he was mostly cut out of the scenes he was in and he was puzzled by it. Well, I didn't like to tell him why, but I knew why. It's not that screen acting is a competitive art form, but a director has to work as well. That is, a director wants to be employed and to do that, they have to get their best work on screen. And when I do a scene, I don't just have one actor, I've generally got two or three or four. So I'm only going to edit, choose the best performances from the actors. So if one actor is standout good and the other three are pretty ordinary, I focus the edit around the very good actor because they're very good and they'll keep the screen alive and they'll keep the story moving. And that is why Film stars are film stars. That's how they get to, to that exalted position, because what they deliver is fabulous. And that's really what people want. So when I ask that simple question, how do I get work? It's really simple. Be very good. Offer up something original, real, alive. Be alive to the moment. Do your preparation. Think about what you're doing. Concentrate. Relax. Enable yourself to give of your best and live in the moment and forget about everybody else. And then you can start to elevate your performances. You won't always succeed. You can't. Acting's an art form. There are, it's not a craft. Lots of people say it's a craft. Yes, voice is a craft. Movement is a craft. There are things that I can teach you which are craft-based. But there are so many small, tiny variables which take an artist to understand that is really an art. And that's why you have to practice. So my advice for anyone wanting to be a film star is to start working with your camera phone. You can all do it. Find a scene on the Internet that suits your casting. And in the Q&A that we'll do in a minute after my, my little lecture here, um, I'll talk about casting if you want. If you find something that suits your casting, find a friend to do it with and film yourself on, the, on, a, on your phone. Most camera phones are better than the television cameras I was using 15 years ago. Much, much better. They capture more detail. They've got more depth of focus. 
so you can actually start to practice bringing your performance to life. So the next time, if you are an actor, that you're going for an audition uh, or you're just sending in some, some lines that you've learned, you'll know how to do it because you would have practiced. So that's my little lecture done now. I hope that you've enjoyed it. I'm going to hand over to Frank now, who will take your questions, which you can ask me. So, um, um, got, got a slight rebuild issue going on here. The occasion to for us to ask Professor Bray on any questions, and uh, before we came to the, we will go to the later part when we will talk about missions and later stuff. But, but today, uh, I think what we should do and what we we really take the opportunity is to ask more questions to to see if you can actually just type out your questions in the chat box. Um, you, uh, there should be a chat box within the GoToWebinar app, and uh, we can all see the, the all the things that we typed out to see if there are, there's some live questions. Yeah, I've sat down because I'm standing up. It's going to be a bit tiring on the feet. Thank you. So is there any questions from the floor? If not, I actually have one question. Um, Professor Bray, I think uh, this is actually very interesting. And uh, today in the audience, I saw a lot of um, students. Most mm -hmm. of them are actually high school students. Uh, apart from, you know, from now, a lot of them, I believe what they will be thinking of is going into a college. And then after that, probably film star, it's a bit five years or 10 years down the road, there's something that they will be thinking in that particular period of time. Um, but before that, I think, uh, is that some advice on choosing a college uh, in terms of acting? You know, what, what, where should they actually go? Um, you know, there, there are plenty of choices if they want to pursue the career mm -hmm. in film. Um, apart from obviously today we are covering for our university, <laughs> um, that, that, I, I'm pretty sure it's actually a very good opportunity for them to, to join us for a program in acting for Global Screen. But um, is there some general advice on what kind of uh, direction, if they want to be a film star, you know, what kind of program should they look into? Should they, be, should they go into a film program directly? Or should they go into some general liberal arts program before they go into film acting? Is there some advice along that direction? Yeah, I would say if you really want to be a film star, come and study for acting for Global Screen with myself. Uh, it's a course absolutely focused on developing the actor as the artist to, to work on film and on stage, which are the, the kind of two twin pillars that an actor has to conquer to develop a career. If you're interested in the arts, and you want to be an actor, you have to think long and hard. You kind of have to search your soul and your heart to see if it's something you really want to follow. It's a very tough life. It's very hard indeed. There are lots of people wanting to be actors. Very few people succeed. Um, and it's a life full of rejection. That is, you go up for a lot of jobs which you don't get. So that can be quite frightening at times when your friends' careers are developing and they're getting married, they're buying houses, and you're still working in a coffee bar. That can be quite terrifying. So you, you've really got to think, is this what I want to do? Also, acting is a vocation. It's almost something you must have to do. Not something you want to do, but you have to do it. I've just gone through the audition process for our first cohort for acting for Global Screen at um, Hong Kong Baptist University. And I was delighted by the amount of talent that we saw. And the people that we chose, nearly all of them, talked about enjoying, loving in many cases, the transformative process of the actor, that is, becoming someone else. There was a famous quote from Stanislavski, which I think is, is as true now as it was a hundred years ago, which is you should love yourself in art, not the art in yourself. That is, it isn't about your ego. 
It isn't about you being on the screen. It is, of course, about that. But really, you've got to enjoy the work. If you don't enjoy the work, it'll show and it'll be very thin and it won't and it'll be ego driven. Um, it's one of the very first things that I teach when I start to work with new actors is to make sure that they understand that they're serving the story, not just their ego. It's not the way they look on camera. It's actually, are they bringing the character as imagined by the writer, the screenwriter, to life properly and enabling the relationship with the director to be stimulating and creative so that the, the, together they can create an interesting story for an audience to watch. So many actors that I've had the misfortune of working with are more interested in the way they look or the way they sound and they give hollow uh, thin performances and it's such a shame so my advice is if you want to do it you must really have a, a long period of soul searching and if you and then if it is what you want to do there are different routes there's obviously uh, drama schools in Europe and in Britain there's Acting for Global Screen here at HKBU. Uh, there are other organizations around us, I know. You could also do a degree in English, history, anything that involves, I think, imagination and lots of reading would lead you in the right direction and enable you to then pick up that career further down the line. So I hope that that has answered your question, Frank. Okay. So, um, is there some other, oh, so we have some questions. Mm -hmm. Just looking up at the board to see what the questions are. So, is the program available for distant learning online course? I'm afraid it isn't. It's a direct course that you come in and you have to study it with us here in Hong Kong. One of the things that's happened because of COVID is that I've been teaching a lot online, obviously over Zoom and, and different apparatuses. And acting is, is, is incredibly difficult to teach on, you know, uh, over Zoom because you need to be in the room, you need to be with each other, you need to have an interreaction with people. So um, that's difficult. I suggest if you're interested, you should go on a course where you're working with people. Um, and if you're really interested, start acting, join a theatre company, create a theatre company, start making films of your own, do whatever you need to do to start telling stories. I think we have plenty of questions for the floor right now. Okay. So what would you say is the best preparation for an audition? Uh, for a screen audition, I presume, Isabel, you're talking about a screen audition. Uh, you must learn the sides. You'll get sent the sides by your agent or by a casting director. There'll be three to four pages of screenplay, and then your character will be, you'll know the name of your character. There's quite a lot of self taping at the moment. That is basically where actors tape themselves on their phones and send them in. Although it's boring and tedious, I suggest to all actors learn the lines and work on them as hard as you would if you were playing the part. It does mean you have to put in an enormous, an enormous amount of effort and work. But if you do, you're more likely to be seen for the job than if you don't. I can tell you the number of self tapes I have seen as a producer is extraordinary. And all we do is literally we click on them and the actor starts acting. We go, no, next, next. So you've got to be absolutely in it right from that first frame engage with the other character, whatever it is, turning away and into camera so that I, the producer, the director, all go, ah, someone here is, is giving it their all, is concentrating, has done some preparation. Then we watch on and we may think, well, they were very good. Let's call them in for an interview. But you have to do the work. That's my advice to all actors for auditions. Do as much preparation as you can and then times it by 10 and start again because you won't have done enough. So keep going. So maybe we can answer the other one. Um, what advice would you what advice would you give 
to people who have zero acting experience and want to be an actor? Um, start acting. That is, get a script with a friend and start working on it. Literally say the lines to each other. Imagine the scene. Improvise. That is, give yourself scenarios. So let's say, I don't know your sex. Is this a boy or a girl? No. Anyway, let's, let's say that you're a boy. So you ask a friend of yours who is a woman uh, to say that she's leaving you. That's a very simple scenario. Uh, you can act that out. There's thousands of scenarios. You can take them from television. You can copy something. But my advice, if you've never acted, is start acting. You start acting in your living room today. You don't need anything. You don't need anything other than someone else to work with or a script. So um, the next one. I have two questions, but my first one that's is comedy in movies too repetitive or too forceful nowadays? Many comedy in movies nowadays aren't really funny. I <laughs> just <laughs> reuse old comedy sequences. Yeah, comedy is really tough. Um, I've directed quite a lot of comedy and it's difficult because it's all about the rhythm and the timing. And again, just as with actors having to be relaxed, so does the filmmaker have to be relaxed. Otherwise, your tension as a director goes into the scene. The problem with comedy is it's hard, really hard to get right. And people are not very patient. That is producers, exec producers, because they won't allow screenplays to be developed very much. That is, we go through a development process, which maybe take one year or three years, and sometimes screenplays go to screen too early undeveloped and the comedy sequences are simply not funny enough or you've just slightly miscast the characters and they're not firing off each other very particularly well or the rhythm is wrong because there's some tension on set coming from the director there can be a host of reasons um comedy is by far the hardest thing to get right but if you get right if you get it right the rewards are enormous so if you're going to be a filmmaker, make comedy films. OK, so another question is from Catherine. Can you describe any strategies for getting into a character on set and really living in the moment as you actually stated? Yeah. One of the ways is to create what they call a circle of concentration around you. So you have to have your imagined circumstances as a character. Where have I been? Where have I come from? And what do I want? Okay, so I'll give you an instance of an exercise I shot quite recently with a group of students. They were coming in and they were about to discover a dead body in the living room for relatively comic effect. So the first actor came in and I said, Where have you been? And he said, Oh, I'm coming home from work. I said, that's not good enough. Where, what sort of journey did you have? What day at work? Did you have a great day at work or a bad day at work? He couldn't really answer the questions because he hadn't done the preparation. Now, the reason I say this is because this will help you get into the moment on set perfectly. Let's take the illustration of finding the dead body in the living room. The best way to deal with it is and if you think about the dynamic of that scene, you're going to end up shocked and surprised. So you don't want to arrive in a shocked or surprised state. You, you, need, you want to have a journey as an actor. So the best way to come through that door would be as relaxed and happy as you could be. So if I think that, I think oh, God, I'm going to be relaxed and happy. What type of day did I have at work? Ah. My boss came up to me and said there was a possible promotion, which means I'll get more money. So I've taken a journey home from work and I'm thinking, ah, great, I'm going to earn some more money. What can I do? I can buy that Porsche. Great, I can go on holiday. I can do these things. So my mind is full of all the things the character wants to do. And now I'm coming into my apartment. Great, I'm going to go to the fridge and open a bottle of champagne because I'm going to be promoted. And off I go. And, and then I see the dead body. 
So do you see, by putting yourself in a circle of concentration, by concentrating on the, the, the known scenario that you're in, it gives you a way in. I've often seen actors standing on set with earphones on, listening to a piece of music to get themselves in a mood. That's the last thing you need to be doing. You don't want to be in a generalized mood. You need to specifically want something. Your mood is there, but you need to be going somewhere to get something. Concentrate on that. So the given circumstances, where your character has come from and what I want. Have those to mind. And then you must remember as a screen actor that everybody on set, everybody around you, the DOP, everyone, they all seem so important. They all know each other. But they are utterly unimportant. The most important person on set is you. You in front of the camera. That's it. So you just blank everything else away. Think about your given circumstances. And then you're in for your objective. What do I want? So another question is a very good one from Leanne. How would you say would the position of the entertainment industry to be after the pandemic? Would it be in a weaker position or would it strive even more? Everything's going to be different after the pandemic. I think this pandemic is a world changing event. It's a piece of world history. The ripples of the effect are going to hit education, industry, business, every level, every part of society, every tier. There will be before COVID and after COVID. It's that big an event. So, of course, it's going to affect the industry. I know now that the film industry is getting back on its feet. I know of two production companies in Australia. They've taken the whole crew, the casts. They live in shielded bubbles, one in New Zealand, one in Australia. Uh, so no one comes in or out. So they're protected and they are making the films that way. I suspect we're going to see more and more of that moving forward. A friend of mine in Britain is about to do a BBC television series. I think it's Doctor Who. And they are going to be shut off in Wales, I think, of all the places in the world, from the world while they make it. So when I was talking to his partner, she said, oh, I'm going to be a COVID widow for four or five months. So whereas an actor would have gone in, done their bit and come home again, now they'll be going off and staying on location for much, much longer. So yes, COVID and the pandemic will affect the industry, it will change it, I suspect, dramatically. Um, as with it, everything. The biggest problem is going to be finance. Uh, business and industry has been hit very hard. There's less money around, and that obviously filmmakers need money to make films. So that we wait and see. But yes, I do think the entertainment industry will be hit big time by the COVID virus. Okay, um, I have another question. Very good one. Um, I have acted in many advertisements and I really want to pursue screen acting in the future. I also like and am quite good at stage acting. Would this information help me get roles during audition? Um, <clears throat> you, well, having done lots of adverts, you certainly are, you are very used to being on a film set. So that will help you. Yes, it will. The problem is, is obviously adverts are quickly shot, they're, they're cut very quickly, and there's not much concentration on the acting. So in terms of a much bigger part, anyone looking at your CV and looking at your showreel, which is just a series of adverts, is going to be slightly worried that there's nothing with any depth or length to it, which is what they're going to want to see. So my advice is always to actors who've done lots and lots of adverts, is try to get into a stage company, a theatre company, and do a play. That way, you will exercise your artistic muscle. You'll also be doing something for a longer period of time, and you'll give directors the chance to see you for two to three hours on stage. It's not always easy, uh, but I think it's very good practice for you, especially if you've been doing lots of adverts. So that's my advice. Okay. Another one, very interesting one. Um, 
To get into live acting, you get you need to do auditions. How about becoming a film director? <laughs> what are the steps on becoming a film director? Well, you can go to a film school, um, or you can be like myself and become an actor. Actors make very good film directors, I think, or directors. And the reason being is we understand the actor. I'm astonished sometimes because I also teach film directing or used to teach film directing at Central St. Martins back in, in the UK. And the number of times I've been watching a director work with the DOP and the lights and everything else, but do absolutely no work with the actor, I was astonished because actors are the clay that you mold, that, you, that you're going to make the film out of. I mean, I always take my student directors to a particular part of the CSM building where there's a whole load of film posters on the wall. And I say, what's this, what, what have all these film posters got in common? And they all look up at the posters and then they get it. They go, and they've all got actors' faces on. And I go, yeah, <laughs> because the people, the first question people ask me is, say, I'm going to see To Be or Not To Be tonight. They'll say, who's in it? You know, actors are incredibly important. So if you want to be a film director, I think acting is a very good way in. I mean, I would say that, wouldn't I? Also, film schools can be good. They can be a little bit technical. But here's my really big piece of advice. Start making films. If you want to be a film director, make films. You can make films on your phone. You can borrow a camera. There's lots of editing equipment that you can get for a laptop. Start making films. That's the best education that you can get. And if you enjoy it, and really filmmaking is just storytelling. It's a complicated, difficult way of doing it, but nevertheless, it's just storytelling. If you get good at telling stories with film and fall in love with it, then there'll be lots of openings for you. You can go to a film school, even study film at university, or go straight into the industry, or become an actor. But start making films today. I think the, we, we should take the last two questions. Mm -hmm. um, the first one, I think it's actually quite interesting. It says, uh, how did you realize you want to be an actor or director? Or probably when did you realize, for your case, Professor Bray, <laughs> <laughs> that you wanted to go down this road? Well, strangely enough, I wanted to be a film director before I wanted to be an actor. Um, I used to be, I used to draw lots of pictures. And I wanted to be an animator and I made an animated film, but it took so long and so much drawing. I was about 11 at the time. So I just took the Super 8 camera off the top of my animation rig and got some friends. And I started filming a, a, a scene, a horror scene in a shed, someone being butchered in a shed. There you go. Um, and I thought, this is fantastic. If I use actors, I can do it very much quicker. And I loved the idea of being a filmmaker. So I sort of tried to become a filmmaker and I became, I got my first job out of school was as a runner on a film set. And I worked my way up technically uh, until I became the assistant cameraman uh, for Langham Films, uh, which was great. We worked with ITM, lots of companies, but I realized I'd gone down the wrong road to be a film director. I'd also been a child actor and, and Anna Scher, who had been my mentor from Anna Scher's Children's Theatre, I asked Anna, I said, what should I do? She said, well, go and be an actor. She said, you can act, you can go and be an actor and you'll get to work with lots of directors so you'll understand about directing. And it was the best advice because I went off to RADA, Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, learned how to act. And then I left and worked with a range of directors, some brilliant, some terrible. I learned about directing. And I brought that to life with my, my vision. And I had, like a lot of people, a lot of luck. I was offered a, a television directing course by a producer and I did it. And then I got a TV series straight after that. So I was extremely lucky to fulfill that dream. Uh, sometimes it's much harder. The real, the back of your question is, when did I, jump ship on acting to directing and that was in my early 30s mainly because one of the problems with being an actor is you are always chosen you never choose you often see uh, 
f interviews with film stars, they always make me laugh because they're always talking about what they're going to do next and their choices. Mostly actors don't choose anything. They are literally being offered jobs which they have to do for money. Um, and I was getting a bit sick and tired of that. And also, I was getting much more interested in writing. And I was writing plays. And my very first play was directed by Peter Gill at first. And I just felt, no, I need to direct this. So I started directing it and fell in love with directing. So really, it's a very long answer to a, a short but brilliant question. I always wanted to be a film director, but then I fell in love with acting and then I fell back in love with directing. So it's a bit of a love affair for me. Okay, so the last one, any film school suggestions? <laughs> no, I'm not going to make a suggestion. I think uh, obviously they run a very good film course at Hong Kong Baptist University, uh, which has got lots of famous alumni, so they must be doing something right. Wherever you look, Whichever university, college, film school you look, look at the alumni, the people who have been there, the careers that they've had. Do your research. Find out whether they have been nurtured by that establishment properly. Uh, it's very important. Um, so that's it, really. Thank you all very much, by the way, for your questions. Lovely. OK, so yeah, we, we do realize that there's actually an overwhelming number of questions. but we shall try to see if uh, Professor Bray will have some time to answer that offline. And then um, today, thank you so much, Professor Bray. No, thank you. It's been great. Great fun. Okay, so so the next part, we'll, we'll move to my part to quickly introduce the university and also the admission process. And uh, thank you, Professor, Professor Bray. Thank so, you. So we'll keep in touch. So, so the next part, Okay, so, okay, so, so for the so next for part. The next part. Uh, we will. Uh, we will, we will uh, Sorry for the echo. Sorry, but, okay, so uh, for the next part, uh, we'll just quickly run through uh, some introduction about Hong Kong Baptist University. Um, Hong Kong, I suspect uh, today when I look at the list of students and counselors, uh, I find that there's actually a lot of students from Malaysia, from actually everywhere around the world. Um, I suspect a lot of you have been to Hong Kong and you will probably already know what Hong Kong is about. And um, of course, you know, Hong Kong traditionally, we are, we are very, we are very famous for shopping. We are very famous for food. We are very famous for the Victoria Harbor, and probably some of you will know Disneyland. But um, it's interesting when I actually survey a lot of our, inter our own international students at the campus, they will tell me, you know, where do they where did they actually spend the weekends? They will all of them, a lot of them will have something in common. They spend a lot of the time in the weekend in the countryside within Hong Kong. That's actually a lot of people that we don't know about that. Um, this picture, if you take a look. Um, it's actually just taken behind uh, our campus. Our campus is um, just somewhere down here in the from overlooking here. So for on a walking distance to this mountain trail, you can actually get to uh, some of the best mountain trails in Hong Kong and also um, in Asia, actually. Uh, if you just go around onto TripAdvisor to, to do a quick Google search on some of the mountain trails, you'll find that um, a lot of the mountain trails in Hong Kong are really excellent. And not to mention um, a lot of, of other places. You can actually uh, take public transport, and in an hour, in an hour or so, you will actually reach a uh, number of beach in Hong Kong as well. So there will, there's actually a good balance of um, outdoor life and also within the concrete jungle. And of course, Hong Kong is a city of opportunities. Just now, I saw some students actually ask the questions whether they will be actually given, getting any kind of opportunities in film acting in Hong Kong. And, um, and Hong Kong, of course, you know, in the 80s, we are very famous for our film industry already. And for Hong Kong Baptist Universities, because we have been the, uh, one of the oldest film school in Hong Kong. So um, in that sense, we have a lot of alumni that are connected in the field currently. Of course, you know, right now, in this few months, I think everywhere around is the same because of the pandemic. 
um, it's slightly affected. But um, you know, from my view, I think Hong Kong will still be Hong Kong, and um, there will be a lot of opportunities actually coming up after the pandemic is over, which hopefully will. Uh, for those of you who will be joining either the university this year or the next year, by the time you graduate, things should be all back to normal, hopefully. And um, Hong Kong is also a city of opportunities as um, it's not difficult to actually get a work permit for those of you who are outside of Hong Kong. So if you want to give it a go in Hong Kong, the four years, after the four years, you actually have an uh, uh, undergraduate degree in Hong Kong. You will be given actually one year visa free upon your graduation to find a job. And then for a total of seven years, including your undergraduate years, uh, you can actually apply for the Hong Kong permanent residence. So uh, a lot of our students who are international students stay on in Hong Kong to work for two to three years. They will actually be give, given uh, Hong Kong PR after that. And uh, strong industries in Hong Kong will actually include financial. So I think that's actually a no brainer that Hong Kong is actually famous for. And there are actually some other professional services and all the uh, service driven industries in Hong Kong as well. Um, universities wise in Hong Kong, um, I have seldom hear students commenting about Hong Kong about its universities. But in fact, uh, we in the whole region, in the Asia region, uh, if you compare the opportunities, Hong Kong is one of the places where there are plenty of um, international uh, English taught English medium in uh, universities, which are government funded. And uh, in that sense, we are very well, well resourced in terms of facilities and faculties as well. So you can see people like Professor Michael Bray. Um, he joined us from a very famous uh, UK schools. And then um, people like him are plenty around different uh, majors around, uh, around the university. So you're pump into people like him around on campus. And in Hong Kong, it's a very small place. Um, where we we are just a dot on the world map, but we have seven million people, and there are actually many highly ranked universities in just a very small city. That says a lot of things about how the universities and how the education scene in Hong Kong is about. And um, in terms of affordability, although you know Hong Kong always pop up as the most or even one of the most expensive cities around the world, but um, we are, in terms of affordability for undergraduate admissions, we are actually about 40% cheaper if you compare that to London, Australia, or US, um, where we charge only about 18,000 US dollar for our uh, fees. And not to mention that there are actually a lot of scholarship opportunities available as well. Um, Hong Kong Baptist University, so um, just a little bit quick background. Uh, about the university, uh, we are founded in 1956. So we are one of the oldest universities in Hong Kong. And uh, in terms of our school of communication, where our school of film is actually seated inside, it's one of the uh, oldest school in Hong Kong in that particular discipline as well. So if you just do some Google in Hong Kong, in most of the film industry, um, most of the, a, lot, a lot of those veteran alumni are actually from our university. And we are located in the city center, and um, we teach in English. And the point about our university is really our student to faculty ratio. Um, we have a student faculty ratio of about 13.5 to 1. So, comparatively to a lot of other universities, we run small classes. So, that will be an age for a lot of the students. Uh, if you consider to a uh, more kind of cozy, uh, a lot of more attention, if you want to if that's something that you look for in a university. And um, quickly jump, I think um, some of the opportunities, what we are looking for, uh, what you can actually expect in Hong Kong, is, um, there will be plenty of internship opportunities. Be it if you, even if you are in the film sector, um, you can actually look forward to a few summers to be working in some of the different companies around in the world. Um, and you're allowed to get paid internships during your studies in Hong Kong. And uh, a lot of those uh, internships can also be outside of Hong Kong as well. So there will be opportunities in both Asia, wider Asia. And we do actually have overseas some internship program in uh, major cities around the world as well. So students will have a uh, different exposure in terms of internships. And we push a lot of students on exchange to different countries as well. So. Um, Go global 
I think this is a very important thing in the university that we encourage most of our, our students to have more than one experience. You know, if you're an international student from another country, when you come to Hong Kong, it's already an international experience for you, but we encourage you to experience something else and to build on to that. And um, of course, one of the things you can simply look forward to is a colorful residential life. So uh, for most of our international students, you will stay on campus, you will interact with local students, interact with other international students, exchange students. So um, in, that will be a great part of the learning that we wish to give you as a student um, in these four years of undergraduate education. So uh, a quick run through, um, just how, uh, in terms of creativity, I think that a lot of those, a lot of you who are looking for creative uh, uh, disciplines, we are very strong in them. Um, we have a film discipline, we have creative discipline like visual arts, our, our academic of uh, visual art is also one of the strongest in Hong Kong, a very unique program. And then we also have things like music. Uh, we have also have things like um, sports that are that we actually try to push the students to different uh, directions. So if you are looking for a total experience, because even if you are in a film school, you won't just take courses from the film school. So you probably take some courses in in music, you'll probably take some courses in other visual arts as well. So it will be a good place for you to cross um, different uh, faculties and also different um, disciplines as well. And um, innovations, it's also a big thing for those of you who are interested in science program, and this will be probably a very interesting journey because innovation within a university is a very big thing right now. And uh, going global, just how I've actually mentioned, we run a few double degree program with um, universities in Canada, in Australia, in uh, Poland as well, and then one more in um, US. So these are some of the options if you want to look for two plus two, two years in Hong Kong and two years in somewhere else to get two degrees from two places. This will be some of the programs that you can actually look into. And, um, just jump to, I think, um, for the number of programs that is available, um, I think that you need no, not much introduction in this one. So you can just go onto our website to look for the programs that will be available um, that uh, you can actually choose. And um, I'll just quickly jump to uh, qualifications. So university entrance requirement, basically we accept most of the qualifications all around, all around the world. Um, if, even if you are applying for an IB background, GCE or any other local qualifications, we actually accept that and then we take holistic um, review on each and every qualifications. Um, and then we have English requirement as well, so be sure to actually check out what is actually required before you submit an application. And um, the, our application for this year, so for those of you who plan to join the university next year, we'll, we will start our application on 17th of September. So the first window will be from September to November. For those of you who are particularly looking for scholarships to come into Hong Kong, um, be sure to apply within the early deadline for a bit more chances for hitting some scholarships. And then um, the main round and extended round will go all the way until next year, May, for next year, uh, September entry. We only have one entry, which is in the September. And I'll uh, quickly run through the fees and expenses. Just now I actually mentioned about 18,000 US dollar. So if you're adding the hall fees and also the personal expenses, it will come to about um, around 25,000 US dollar per year all in. So if you compare that to um, different major cities around the world, we are actually not the most expensive because uh, Hong Kong's education is highly subsidized by the Hong Kong government. So the fees in terms of tuition are subsidized as well. And uh, not to mention, apart from that, we run a rather sizable university admission scholarship program. So um, our academic merit-based scholarships will amount up to 190,000 Hong Kong dollar per annum, which is renewable every year. So basically, if your scores is good, we'll consider um, students who are strong to be covered, almost fully covered, uh, in terms of their tuition fee, fees past uh, the hall fees and also living expenses covered by scholarships for full four years. 
So you just have to uh, renew it every year with a 3.0 GPA out of 4.0. And um, there are also other government scholarships as well available, especially if you're in the Belt and Road countries. Um, so um, this year we have a few students who, who actually got uh, funded by the Hong Kong government to join Hong Kong Baptist University from uh, the government scholarships. And um, overall, um, just another word of assurance, we are not shy to award the best students with uh, good university scholarships. And this year, we just have confirmations from our management that that uh, the university's commitment towards our scholarship will not decrease even in terms of pandemic. So for the students who are applying for next year entry, that uh, your the chances of scholarships will not be dampened or we do not have a budget cut on that particular front. I think that's actually something that uh, is a good news for our students. And uh, for those of you who want to give it a try, I think, um, just connect with us, I would say, um, uh, through the different channels, through email or through our website or through our Facebook account. And then um, we take each an individual application on a very separate basis. So be sure that you'll be sure that we will follow up with each and every application. Um, and that's something that uh, we will promise our students. And um, before we go to a uh, quick q and if you have some questions, I think some students ask if this particular PowerPoint or recording of the previous, uh, the whole webinar will be shared. We will be sharing this webinar with all the attendees uh, on the recording. And then I will try to forward those unanswered questions to Professor Bray as well to see if he has some quick answer or see some general answer and also general advice for those of you who leave your questions within uh, the chat box as well. So uh, before I end today's sessions today, uh, is there some uh, questions you want to ask pertaining uh, uh, the content of admissions or do you have any other questions you want to ask in terms of scholarships and in other uh, uh, things you want to double clarify? Okay, uh, I don't see much more questions left. So um, thank you all. I think uh, a good part of you still retain to the end of the presentation. I think that's uh, really thank you for your attention today. And I will share with you the whole recorded content later on. And if you have any other questions following up after the presentation, uh, be sure to reach out to us. Or uh, and then um, you can also. Uh, I will leave my email address in the comment box. So in case if you have any questions regarding admissions, feel free to send an email to me and I will try to answer uh, the round. Okay. Okay, so um, thank you for your attention and uh, that's all for today's session. Thank you.